Um, thank you all. Uh, talking about reproducibility in, in the collection of historical primary sources. Um, as you can see from this uh, first slide, I have um, one foot in uh, university libraries. Uh, that's where my primary appointment is. But I also am faculty in the Department of History and a practicing historian. Um, I want to start today by just talking about what is historical research. Um, this isn't everything historical research is, but in, in broad strokes, um, historical research has a domain that is really nothing less than all that has happened ever. Um, and I'm being a little facetious there. Uh, really, it's about uh, you know our, our human record and about 5,000 years ago to about 30 years ago. Um, our object, likewise, anything that survives from the past, um, but really that's pretty much documents and to a lesser extent artifacts. Um, the practice is uh, primarily about collecting and interpreting traces of the past. Uh, that actually, uh, really manifests itself in uh, in current uh, practice, uh, taking photos of documents and archives and teasing out a fact-based story. Today, what I want to focus on is um, collection. Uh, there's lots of issues around reproducibility in interpretation and analysis uh, that we could get into, but today I'm going to focus on um, kind of that primary data collection. Historians don't like to think about their archival sources as data necessarily. Um, a lot of my students really struggle with this. They see them as um, something more rich uh, than that. But um, we're going to focus on collecting and the process of collecting primary archival uh, sources. So how do historians collect their objects of study? Um, this is a, a fair example, but I want to back up um, uh, before uh, I should say that most of our things don't look like, uh, I don't know, like a mushroom or something. Uh, but uh, this is one of the more interesting documents I've ever seen. But I uh, want to back up before, uh, how, before getting to the archive and uh, look at uh, how we search for where to search. So that search used to start with people. Uh, primarily, historians would uh, connect with advisors, colleagues, other experts in the field at other institutions, and of course, librarians and archivists and, and curators as well. Um, then it would be a delving into uh, secondary literature, uh, mostly housed at libraries, uh, reverse engineering bibliographies, so um, seeing where references were to archival sources um, in published literature. Um, and when that failed, uh, because uh, uh, historians did not have a lot of systematized way, and still do not have lots of systematized ways um, to cite uh, everything they find in the archive that they use, uh, they would look at the acknowledgments for where they went, which archives they went to. Sometimes this would reveal additional archives that weren't in the bibliography. Um, but now that search often starts with Google. Um, we, uh, are, my colleague and I, a uh, colleague in history and I are working on an NEH grant. Um, we're interviewing historians about their research practices and uh, they're unabashedly telling us that they start with Google. And um, what does a Google search for primary sources return? Um, we don't really know. Uh, we, we know a little bit, uh, we could try it ourselves, but I think everyone would get a little bit of a different um, uh, results and uh, we wouldn't be able to exactly uh, reproduce those same results. Uh, and so I want to not exactly focus on on Google, uh, but I do, or, or, or that kind of unreproducible um, broad web search, uh, but I do want to uh, tell a little bit about the story of how that's affecting the practice of research in the field of history. And Lara Putnam in the field's um, real, really leading journal uh, had a great quote on how uh, digitization and uh, the, uh, what we'll get to in a second is called kind of the age of abundance is affecting the profession. Uh, Lara says, source digitization has transformed historians practice. For the first time, historians can find without knowing where to look. As a result, at an unprecedented rate, we are finding connections in unexpected places powering publication on mobile ideas and international audiences, circuits, networks, and border crossing flows. Technology has exploded the scope and speed of discovery. Um, and as I said, this is, is uh, building upon Roy Rosenzweig's 
uh, real foundational uh, work on what, what he calls the age of abundance. Historians, in fact, may be facing a fundamental paradigm shift from a culture of scarcity to a culture of abundance. So what is abundance? Uh, what is an abundance of digital resources, uh, of digital archival material uh, that's easily accessible, that's at hand, mean for historical primary source collection? Uh, in lots of ways, everything. Um, as Putnam shows empirically, it's actually changing what historians are studying. So if you read through that work, um, she's actually showing that uh, it is the most likely cause that uh, there is so much transnational scholarship uh, that we do not have to travel physically to archives across the globe as much. Um, and it's changing how much depth and the, the kind of affective experience of being in an archive and what that has meant to uh, historical scholarship. So it's really changing the whole practice uh, as Putnam uh, implicates and uh, very compellingly so. But at the same time, it's not really changing much. Um, we're, we're sort of trading one black box for another. Um, I couldn't resist uh, showing you all this. Uh, uh, maybe a few of you have seen this. It's a, uh, it's a sort of black box. Um, this is where I did my research about a year and a half ago for um, one of my forthcoming, or for my forthcoming book. And uh, basically it's a black pyramid. Um, it's, it's kind of a black box of sorts. And I think what, uh, if you saw me, even if you saw me in the room, um, I don't know how much you would know about what was going on uh, as I was looking through the papers I was there to consult. Um, so uh, traditional archival research is really a black box. Historians don't typically share the genesis of their research, their preliminary research, their search strategies to select the archives to visit in person, their search strategies at archives, um, really the depth of their searches. And what I mean by this is they don't share whether or not they are um, uh, looking at the indexes to, or just looking at the metadata of collections, just the very uh, top level identifiers of what a collection might contain, or if they're going down to the box level descriptions of what a collection may, uh, contains, or if they're going down to the folder level, which some collections are fortunate enough to have, or if they're going down all the way down to the uh, full text searchable level and what quality that text is, OCR, transcription, things like that. Um, also archival searches or visits that return no results, so um, kind of a no uh, a result and uh, or a negative result, I'm sorry. And, and uh, also uh, above all or of all of the above, and uh, in, in regards to their research at other institutions like um, research at museums or um, uh, uh, other cultural institutions or uh, to other kinds of evidence like artifacts or art. So archival research in our digital age is also a black box. Um, historical primary source searches suffer even more now uh, because archival indexes are uncommon and they're notoriously incomplete. Um, OCLC has Archive Grid, and it's a great index, um, but it is far from in, far from complete and uh, really geographically biased in some ways. Um, it also uh, the description of collections in every archive has always varied, uh, but I think there's something about the interface of an online search that kind of masks that um, and allows it. It's it almost allows us to forget. Um, what variance there was in how collections were described. And we almost, uh, historians almost never know when a collection uh, was described. That's a very uh, significant act. And we don't know if it was described in the 1930s or if it was described in 2019. Um, also the age of abundance is really unevenly abundant and it's unclear how. And what I mean by that is, uh, we don't know the extent of digitization of all archives. We usually don't know the extent of digitization of any one archive. Uh, we sometimes uh, think that an entire collection is digitized, but there were some aspects of it that weren't. So it's unclear exactly what we're searching, even when we have a fully or close to fully digitized collection. Uh, just a few words on why history has largely ignored reproducibility. 
history exists between the social sciences and the humanities. Um, and uh, I was at an institution before here where uh, I was in a social sciences uh, division, and here I'm in a humanities division. Uh, and uh, it's like that all over the country. Um, and I think the humanities especially has either been uh, able to ignore a lot of the calls for reproducibility or um, even contest them. Historians rarely collaborate. Um, I, I think this has an effect on reproducibility because you don't have to make something accessible or even reproducible to a partner, uh, even to someone else in research. Um, and uh, they, they basically, uh, the, the solo authored monograph is the gold standard as, uh, in the field still. Um, and I should say here uh, an aside uh, that I think historians uh, do collaborate. I just don't think they acknowledge the, acknowledge the extent of that collaboration, especially with their uh, closest collaborators, which are librarians and archivists. Um, historians have also de-emphasized methodological discussions and training. Um, this is relegated mostly to professional magazines, things uh, like perspectives on history from the American Hist Historical Association, rather than the journals in the field. Um, and history is a science of traces, not experiments. Finally, um, I think historians have kind of failed to make a connection uh, between the systematic review of secondary sources or even just basic literature, uh, literature reviews and the primary activity of the field, which is archival research um, and how applicable uh, uh, this systematic review processes, which really value reproducibility, protocols, uh, transparency, sharing, things like that, how that could be applied to archival research. Um, why should historians care about reproducibility? Well, uh, as I just mentioned, the health sciences and the library sciences have a ready-made method for them. There's many things we can borrow from uh, systematic review um, and uh, how we can uh, import those practices uh, that center on protocols, that center on uh, transparency and reproducibility and uh, uh, apply them to uh, the search for primary archival sources. Also, transparency really facilitates training in the field. I think uh, we uh, do a disservice to our students when we don't tell them how we do our work at its most basic level. Um, if the, the core, I think it's hard for many historians to articulate their methodology, but if they'd say one thing in common, it's probably be, we do archival research. Well, what does that entail? And I think the transparency that we could uh, produce around a reproducible, uh, primary source search uh, would really help facilitate training. And finally, um, archives, archives are a space of privilege. It's actually a huge time cost, a huge financial cost to go to an archive. Um, so uh, making our practices more reproducible and transparent allows us to uh, help our students and help others in the field uh, understand where they should put their resources and I think in general produces a more efficient field. So uh, what might the reproducible collection of primary historical primary sources entail? Uh, I think registration um, and less so for uh, maintaining an exact precise uh, protocol for or, or exact precise uh, uh, topical focus. Um, you, you can uh, venture into new areas, uh, but more to show, to share the, with the field what is happening in progress. Um, documentation, um, search strings, archi archives consulted, um, where you go when, uh, the depth of every search, as I've mentioned, are we searching the box level, are we searching the uh, folder level, are we getting full text search, things like that. Data sharing, um, really clear, uh, search of methods and findings almost to a protocol level. How did we do this? Where did we do it? Um, what did we find when we did it? Um, and I think this can be done on in easily, fairly easily for digital or digitized resources, um, but it can also be done when we visit an archive, um, maintaining uh, something that is like a log of exactly what we're doing, how we're searching, um, even that can be to an extent reproducible. Um, and I think kindness. Uh, there's really no exact crisis of reproducibility in history. Um, I don't think the field is in a troubled spot uh, with reproducibility, but I do think the fact that we're not being as reproducible in this aspect of our work as we could be 
um, is, is really problematic. And I think there's structural barriers to um, making this change or to accelerating this change. I don't think many people in the field are thinking about it. Um, I don't think they're uh, educated to the extent they need to be uh, to uh, introduce it in methodology courses. And I think librarians can really help there. Um, and I also think uh, our effort should just here in, be rooted in sharing our process to make our practice more accessible. Uh, the, the, most, the biggest promise of reproducibility in the field of history, in the field of, uh, or in the practice of primary source collection is to actually save um, our students and our colleagues uh, quite a bit of uh, financial and time resources. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you.